Hey, how are you? Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show, founder of Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of traditional martial arts and traditional martial artists, probably someone like you. If you're watching or listening to this show, you probably are a passionate traditional martial artist. It's probably part of your lifestyle. And that's why we do so many different things, because life is not just one thing. Life is not just a podcast or a teacher. Life is so much more. Now, if you check out whistlekick.com, you're going to see what more we've got going on. Everything from protective equipment and apparel to gear bags, uh, events, training programs, lots of stuff. And if you use the code PODCAST15, that'll save you 15% on just about everything over there. A couple things are excluded because their prices are already so low. But you know what? Uh, go check it out. If you haven't been in a while, you'll probably find something you like there. The show, WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com is the place to go for that because we keep it simple and we keep it separate. What are you going to find over there? Transcripts, links, social media for our guests, lots and lots of great stuff. Now, today's guest, Grandmaster Eddie Minyard, you're going to find links to his stuff. My conversation with Grandmaster Minyard today is one that I'm, I'm going to be really honest. I, I didn't know where it was going to go when we started out. Uh, I had some suspicions. He and I had had a couple very brief conversations. And I am so, so thankful he came on the show. Had an absolutely wonderful conversation that I will sum up with, you can both honor tradition and challenge tradition. And in that way, he and I are so wonderfully aligned and it led to a great conversation that I'm sure you will enjoy. Check it out. And I'll see you on the other side. Hello, how are you? Hey, it's good, Jeremy. How are you, man? I'm good. I'm glad to be here with you. Thanks for coming yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. My pleasure. Um, you know, I'm about diving right in. Uh, Let's dive. It, it would be great if uh, we have a big thing coming up in July where we're taking the ashes of uh, Supreme Grandmaster Bachman Kim back to Korea to be interred mm -hmm. in the National Cemetery. Wow. And that's going to be a, a fairly major event in the world of Taekwondo. So, you know, getting that out there wouldn't be a Sure. Problem. Well, let's, let's start talking about that. It's already out there. Let's All right. uh, tell, tell us who this person was so, and, uh, and why they're significant to you. It's probably. Okay, great. Both, both of those things are relevant. So number one, uh, uh, Bachman Kim was one of the founders of the art of Taekwondo. General Choi Young Hee was actually the man who, who formulated it, but uh, the general pulled together a team of of uh, experts around him in martial arts to help him to develop the art of Taekwondo, develop the forms, and then become ambassadors for that um, throughout the world, really. Mm. So uh, at the time, uh, Bachman Kim, original founders of the art, um, struck up a great relationship with uh, with uh, General Choi and was actually uh, instrumental in the development of 15 of the 24 forms that are still used today by the International Taekwondo Federation known as the Chung Han forms. Mm -hmm. So he uh, he was very instrumental as a, as a senior leader in, you know, in the art of Taekwondo. Mm -hmm. I was introduced to him by my own grandmaster uh, 30 38 years ago, I guess. And uh, he became a friend and a mentor to me in the course of that, that time. Um, you know, he had a, in the end of his life, he had a studio uh, along with a Grandmaster Brad Ship in New Jersey. Grandmaster Ship trained with, um, with uh, Supreme Master uh, Kim since he was 10 years old. Mm. So he really sort of became you know, a son and a, a student and a disciple of uh, of this pioneer of the art of taekwondo and is now the uh, in the course of all of that time master kim was never really satisfied with where taekwondo had sort of evolved towards they had moved away from some of the things that are were, were substantially instrumental in the early parts of the art it was a martial art i mean taekwondo mm. was a 20th century art and it was developed for in the military by the military for the military and over the course of time, the, the art of Taekwondo began to evolve into different directions, sport direction and others, and, and mm -hmm. they sort of moved away from 
some of the use of weapons, for example, and some of the more practical aspects of Taekwondo. So uh, initially, um, uh, Grandmaster Kim developed, wrote a book called uh, Practical Taekwondo, which is mm. an important book in our, again, in the, in the discipline. And he refocused on, uh, on the art of using weapons, uh, including bayonets, by the way, knives, mm. bayonets, mm -hmm. and developed what is known as the Sila, S-I-L-L-A, Sila knife pattern, which is still used by uh, the International Taekwondo uh, mm. practitioner. So very interesting guy. And then uh, had a bit of a falling out with General Choi because of some of the, the changes that General Choi wanted to incorporate, and he didn't. And, uh, but I, so I, I smile and laugh because General Choi had a lot of fallings out with a lot of people. He did. Well, you know what? I mean, I've been training in Korean martial arts for 50 years, and uh, we can make another list over here, but I'm not going to do that online. The uh, But nevertheless, so... so uh, Master Kim developed his own system called Chun Kun uh, Taekwondo, which is basically, you know, total health mm -hmm. Taekwondo. So it really focused on the internal aspects and incorporated the weapons and enhanced on some of the forms and movements that he had developed uh, previously for Taekwondo, because over time you you see things differently. I mean, you've been in the arts long enough to know that in, in certain forms, certain systems, things tend to evolve, right? Mm -hmm. You see it. A little bit better way to do it. You're not. You don't have the same restrictions that you might have had, uh, you know, 50 years ago or 60 years ago in environment and in thinking. So he took some of those forms and enhanced them in ways that that just seemed to make a lot of sense. So he mm -hmm. he evolved that whole art. But regardless, I mean, the uh, you know people come in this world and people go in this world. So you know. Uh, a few years ago, unfortunately, it was time for Master Kim, at the, you know, in his 80s, to you know, to move on from this mortal coil. And uh, I was honored to be at his bedside the night before he passed away. And mm. you know, uh, we had uh, he had been planning a major seminar for his birthday, right around the time of his birthday. So we had this seminar. Um, it wasn't on his birthday, but it was close. And we had this seminar. And uh, he was in his hospital bed and watching on an iPad. And Brad Shipp's mm. mother, who's a nurse, was at his bedside. Mm. And we ran the seminar, all the masters and grandmasters in this seminar. We ran the seminar. It ended at 5 p.m. Master Kim expired at 5.01. Mm. So he stuck it out to the very end. And uh, since that time, Brad has been working diligently with the government of South Korea to have uh, uh, Supreme Master Kim's ashes interred in the National Cemetery at the military academy. Mm. And it was finally approved. So in July uh, 13th, we fly over. And on the 18th, we will be interring his ashes there with full honors. And there will be, uh, you know, I, I will be part of a contingent of about 25 masters and grandmasters coming from the US. But the International Taekwondo Federation We'll be bringing an additional group of maybe fifty, you know, yeah. to this event. So it'll be a pretty big deal. Wow! You know, when, when it's that. it sounds like quite the honor for someone who contributed a lot. You know, uh, I, I don't know if you know, I, I do have some taekwondo. Um, okay. For a, a bit, I, I do have my black belt, and so I've I've dug in a bit. And of course, we've had folks on the show who had varying experiences in early days. Right, Taekwondo. So I, I've I've picked up some bits and pieces, and um, it is clear why he is significant to you, and that that he is, of course, significant to you. And I, I uh, I'm sorry for your loss, of course, but yeah. also, um, it's pretty neat that you get to be part of something that is for his legacy such a big deal. Right, right, and I think for the. You know, the, this is a, a really good segue into, you know, where are we in Taekwondo mm. today, right? So you, you've had some experience, you've had some of the guests, so you, uh, this is not news to you, maybe to some of the, the, uh, the, the people who watch or listen to this, but I mean, Taekwondo has been like, throw it in a blender, boop, you know, <laughs> whatever comes out. There's a lot of flavors out. right now. A lot of flavors, sadly, and, uh, and you know, less and less unification, unfortunately, of uh, and it's because of the disciplines, right? So we have the World Taekwondo Federation, now just World Taekwondo. WTA. Yes, 
they got a little over the WTF acronym. But, well, you, my favorite part about that <laughs> is how long it took them to make that decision. Yeah, to figure the that time, out. <laughs> the time, well, not just that, but the time from which they formally said, okay, we need to think about this to the time that they finished thinking about it. You know, this right. was not a short period of time. It was, right. if I remember correctly, it was something like eight years. Don't yeah. quote me on that, but it was, that's what my, my recollection is. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, the, the obviously the, the WT and the Cookie One space is really formally oriented towards um, Olympic style mm -hmm. competition. And, and that's fine because, you know, in Korea, in South Korea, uh, it is the national sport mm -hmm. of South Korea and they've learned it at every Asian school. And it's really oriented towards, like we do with baseball players or basketball players, it's oriented towards creating that next generation mm. of young athlete, athletes that can compete in, on the world stage, representing the country, right, the nation. And ITF, on the other hand, has always been more on the traditional side, and it's really been more about the martial art and the traditions of the martial art. But then when you really look at what's gone on in the world, I mean, man, can you pick enough flavors, right? So one thing I will say about WT, and I will be visiting the Kuki Wan when I'm in there, and I, I have actually studied and trained in uh, WT systems, and, mm -hmm. you know, from the earliest of days, in fact, in my experiences in martial arts, we were focused on the, the patterns, uh, and the shifting patterns, you know, they went from, you know, from one style to another in the basic forms. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I have nothing bad to say about WT or WTF, but they are the one uh, organization that has maintained sort of a straight line approach right. to how they teach, how they train, the, uh, the mission focus or whatever. Uh, ITF, on the other hand, is broken off into, you know, what Quan were you from or your, is your lineage? And, you know, are we, you know, uh, global? Are we world? Are we international? Are we... You know, the, the, the interesting thing is most of them have actually still stuck with the Chung Hung patterns, the original mm. 24 forms, but with different ideas on, you know, do we do sine wave today or don't we do sine wave today, you know, in the, in the course of the movement. And um, while I can do sine wave, I'm not a fan. And, you know, that's that's one of the me, choices. Me, me either. Right. So, but, you know, bottom line, it is... Um, it's this diversity and and more than diversity, but division that has kind of kept folks away. And you know, it's like uh, it's like the Yankees and and uh, the Red Sox, right? I mean, Great analogy. Yeah. Bottom line, though, you know, we're all playing baseball, and uh, don't put either one either. If either team plays against a team from Japan, who are you rooting for? Right. Right. It's a great. So, it's a uh, great point. Yeah. That. So. So it's. Uh, it's interesting, and there are some groups that are trying to pull some of that together. You know, I'm I'm wearing a shirt here representing my induction into the official Taekwondo Hall of Fame, mm. of which there is only one truly recognized. That's recognized by Kukiwan. Mm. It's recognized by by ITF HQ in Korea, and the membership. If you were to go and Google up who all are are inductees into the uh, the official Taekwondo Hall of Fame, it crosses every discipline. It crosses the, the you know the traditional uh, Chung Wu Kwan mm -hmm. style folks, the Jido Kwan you know traditionalist style folks, WT and ITF all the way back to the beginning of it. And I think that if you look at some of the things, it's, it's run by um, uh, Grandmaster Gerard Robbins. And if you look at what Gerard has been trying to do with this, it is that that bring together the minds of understanding that we are, as the general once said, one Taekwondo. Is sort of the, mm. the grand desire. It's just that folks get kind of hung up on, you know, mine's bigger than yours kind of thing, which is, you know, horseshit just between us chickens. But, uh, right, right. You know. So, yeah, I mean, I, I really look at it and I say, okay, great, sport for sport's sake, go for it. You know, I mean, I'm never going to be that, that young man, and nor was I ever that young man that would do a 570 degree jump spinning kick while doing three backflips in the air and breaking boards at 15 feet, right? Oh, it, uh, I now know exactly what you're referencing. And I suspect a good portion of the audience does too. Those those breaking demos are impressive. They are impressive. You know, I mean, and not the same, you know, people make fun of it and say, well, they're paper thin boards. And so what? Can you jump up there? You know, show me that you can do that without any boards. Right. Precisely. Yeah. 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 So, 
you know, and God bless him. I mean, that's that is a discipline in and of itself. Absolutely. You know, uh, I don't know whether you want to call that uh, uh, taekwondo gymnastics, like <laughs> the gymnastic approach to to uh, taekwondo, but but what you know, uh, still and all, you have to give big rounds of applause sure. for the strength, well, power, it, discipline. If they can do that, they can probably do rather effective things without jumping fifteen feet in the air. You know, well, that's always been, been my point. If you know, people will will look at some of the flashier things that happen, whether in Taekwondo or anywhere, anywhere else. And I say, if you have the strength and the balance and the speed and the just the, the raw proprioception to pull these things off, you're probably going to be a fairly competent martial artist at, you know, normal stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, look at the folks make fun of high kicks. I mean, all of part of Taekwondo. Well, OK, if I can kick high. And do it with power and with focus. Well, what happens if I kick you in the solar plexus? It's a lot easier. You know, it's a lot easier, but that power and that strength are still going to be there, maybe more so, Even and more the so. balance too that it takes to to get to that. So you know, yeah. at seventy two years old, I mean, I used to be known as a headhunter when I fought. Now I'm more like a shoulder surfer. Right? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard that term. I like that. I don't. I don't quite have the uh, the same extension that I did as a young fighter, but. Uh, but I'm still I'm still kicking every day. That's right? awesome. At the end of the day. So That's awesome. bottom line is uh, you have to you have to work within your limitations, understand what they are, and don't denigrate someone else for their technique. Exactly. You know, I'll tell you a little aside story. I mean, I, I still travel around quite a bit, refereeing and judging at, at uh, tournaments all over the country, and I was at an open tournament in Nebraska. And there was a, a young man who stepped up who was a um, uh, Jap Okinawan system is going to evade me at the moment. But not, nevertheless, he, he stood out there and he did Bathai. Hmm. And he did maybe the most amazing rendition I've ever seen of hmm. Bathai. Chris, power, game face, you know, they had everything going 100%. One of the judges, Taekwondo judges, and I know the guy, so one of the judges gives him a 7.5. And I'm like, well, at the end of it, I mean, I gave the guy like a 9.5. You know, at the end of the day, the kid came in second place because he was he was down there. I asked the judge, I said, what's going on? He said, I don't like the way they did the front kicks. And, Ooh, open your worldview a little bit. You know, it's it, it's a, it's you have to look at the discipline for the sake of the discipline. Not what you think it should be, but is it is it appropriate and is it does it have all the right elements? Right. And it's a, it's a shame that you don't see enough of that out there that people will open their minds and give that appreciation to the broader elements of the arts. There's a lot of this is the right way or the only way or the best way. And anybody who does anything else is somewhere between ignorant and wasting their time right and makes me sad because yeah, you know yeah. e even in the history of taekwondo that you're talking about it came from elsewhere too right pulling pieces from other places yeah. and, yeah. and yeah. refinement over time as we kind of yeah. put things side by side and say let's do this and not this and I've always said if there was one art that had it all figured out, we would have figured that out. And that's what all of us would do. Right. No, I, I agree with you. And, and you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, the General Choi and many of the other original founders were Shotokan sites, right? I mean, they grew up in, you know, whether they liked it or not, under uh, in Japan and under Japanese uh, occupation. Mm -hmm. uh, Nam Sok Lee, one of the original founders also of Chang Kwan, and then ultimately Taekwondo as well. Uh, was a Shuanfa fighter, and he learned it from a Buddhist monk. And then he, you know, he began to just train on his own. What this guy showed him on his periodic trips through town, and then he evolved it. But he refused to incorporate any of the Japanese techniques in because he was so adamantly opposed to the Japanese. Yet, if you look at some of the original forms, look at Muda Kwan, for example. So, you know, you're doing you're doing Basai, you're doing Jong. You're doing. You're not you know, even changing the names. No, they're not. Uh, you know, <laughs> maybe they 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 call it balsek because that's a Korean word for basai, right? But it, 
still in all. I mean, you know, you really are some of the movements, you know, as they are in Japan, it was a Basai one, Basai, you know, you know, Basai Dai, Basai, you know, a little bit of variation here and there, but even Koryo, uh, the original first black belt form in Taekwondo was modified. It was the original Koryo and then there was Koryo as it's performed today. But what's the sort of change? I struggle with the names because I learned so many of my Taekwondo forms in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, the the lateral form, like you're up against the wall. Uh, well, there's, there's a kapoyang is one of them, which is basically all side to side movement. Yeah, that yeah, it is. Kapoyang. It is so close to yeah. the Ishinru version of Nahanshin yeah, that it, I it, learned. It, I cannot keep both in my brain. Yeah. I, I, I've, well, I've tried. I've spent so much time and they will not both sit in there at the same time. Yeah, no, I, I, I get you. And it's uh, it, it, that's challenging enough. But I grew up, you know, I was moving around a lot as a, mm -hmm. as a young post-Vietnam guy. And uh, I managed to train with some amazing Korean instructors mm -hmm. in the course of this period of time. But I learned Tanji, Dangun, Dosan, Wan Hyo, Yoko, all of the basic the traditional forms. But then all of a sudden, I'm training with a WT, uh, WTF at the time guy and learning uh, Page 1, Page 2, Page 3. And the differences might be the difference between doing a high block punch and doing a high block punch. Yeah. And, you know, but it's the same so motions, close. same yeah. steps. And it's like, okay, which way do I go now? Which one am I doing? And then, of course, they change it to the Teguk forms, which was. Right. Had a whole different flavor, mm -hmm. <laughs> but again, I, I get you. I mean, you know, it's it's, but it's like uh, you know, I collect uh, guitars and pocket knives, and the uh, I consider collecting forms, uh, you know, like that too. I just mm -hmm. sometimes pick one I really like from, like I love Basai. Yeah, Basai is a great form. It's a great form. So you know, I do Basai Dai as part of just my regular training regimen. But, you know, I'm I'm 72 years old, so my memory banks are not what they used to be. I think I haven't been able to flush the the, uh, the registers as well as I should have. But, you know, now I stick with just a few that I know are helpful mm. to me. It keeps my mind, my body focuses. It keeps my breath going. So, I, you know, I do a series of forms every day just to keep my, my energy and my focus and my health where I think it needs to be. You mentioned Vietnam. Is is that where you started <coughs> your training? Was in the military? Well, so, so no. I mean, it's. Uh, I actually started training in 1965, maybe even before that. My stepfather was uh, was a hand to hand combat instructor oh. in the army, and then he was in the air force. So I was a military brat. So I was always doing something. So we were we were learning, you know, keep your dukes up and doing these various traps and and uh, and. The, the, basically the type of, you know, jujitsu-ish stuff yep. that the military was teaching in the late 50s, early 60s as part of their hand-to-hand -hand combat program. But in, uh, in, I was 14, I read a book called Judo Boy, and that yep. tripped my trigger. You know, I was, you know, going into, just about to go in as a freshman in high school, and I discovered that uh, all the way across town. I lived in an area in Illinois. I don't know if you're familiar with Illinois at all, but I'm not. There's there's an area there called the Quad Cities. So it's the place where it, the Mississippi River divides Iowa and Illinois at that point. Okay. So there are two towns on the Illinois side and two towns on the Iowa side that they call the Quad Cities, although each of them has suburbs that extend out even further. So a 45-minute bus ride from my house, there was a school that taught judo. Uh, Jesse Mills, so since then Jesse Mills. So I would go to the school, you know, two nights a week. You know, I have to get out of school and go over there, ride the bus over, take judo classes, and then come back. But about the third class, I realized he also taught shoreru karate, and I said, I like that. That's where I kind of where I want to be. So I started taking shoreru lessons. And then, you know, things went a different way and, you know, I just couldn't bear the the cost or the time to continue to go. So that was my real first exposure, right, in, in practical wearing white pajamas and jumping around kind of experience. But then in Vietnam, I uh, I saw a demonstration by the White Tiger Division of the, of the Army of Korea. And these guys are doing Taekwondo stuff in full field gear. 
there's a ninth infantry uh, taekwondo group and they were they were crazy badass individuals i mean they were so badass that the north koreans and the Viet Cong would do anything they could to keep from having to encounter and fight korean soldiers mm -hmm. literally anything they could do so they uh but i saw these guys man they're jumping around in full field gear right doing their thing and i'm like well, that's got my trigger trip. Came home in the 1970 and uh, made real good friends with a fellow in Vietnam who was also had taken Taekwondo lessons. So when I got back home, I began to work out with him. He mm -hmm. got home right after I did. And I began to experience Taekwondo, but I didn't really find a true teacher until uh, 1973. And I found uh, Master Chung Yun Kim in Davenport, Iowa. And he was uh, had been the head instructor for the Korean Marines and was a genuine, you know, bad actor in his own right, right? An interesting guy and really focused. And we trained like we trained as Marines, you know, back in those early days of training. It was hard, you know, strict discipline. You know, you'd whack with a shinai if you were doing the wrong thing, or, or even the right thing the wrong way or the wrong thing the right way. You know, you would get that, you would get corrected. And, it, uh, and that was my first real exposure to the true art of Taekwondo. And I mm. just haven't really looked back. I've trained in a lot of other things along the way. Uh, American freestyle, jiu-jitsu, and, you know, the Baising Shuan Kung Fu with my friends out in you know, Illinois, Yili Chuan uh, Kung Fu. And then, you know, fighting and training against other uh, Okinawan and Japanese stylists. I've always been open to... You know what is what's cool about this? What makes this work? Mm. And why did? How can I incorporate some of that where I'm at while still maintaining the traditional focus that I want to maintain with the art of mm. Taekwondo? So, so uh, I'm going to ask a question, and yeah. and on the surface, it might sound like I'm like I'm poking at you, and I promise I'm not. Yeah. You you've just talked about the seeing the value in how other styles do things, how things, you know, there's a lot of benefit in, in different approaches. But earlier we were talking and you, you brought up, um, it seems like you were lamenting the loss of standardization within ITF or Taekwondo overall, however you want to look at it. Mm -hmm. And I can see those two feelings coexisting, but I'd like you to speak to it because I, I want to know how you look at those okay, two things. Sure. So I think if you're going to, uh, first off, let me say this, that I think that he whose only tool is a hammer soon sees the world as a nail, right? right. Exactly. Uh, but if you're going to focus in a traditional uh, manner to focus on an art of Taekwondo, focus on that art. I'm not suggesting that you, that you, uh, violate the tenets of that art or that you dilute it by saying, you know, if I just did this this way, then it would be better. I'm not mm. trying to improve on something that there, a lot of people ahead of me developed and got where they are. From my own perspective, though, I might find something that might work just a little bit better for me. Mm. You know, a I sing Shuan Kung Fu, one of the, the things that, that I still do today. If I'm in, you know, if I really want to execute a really solid front kick, I will toe out a little bit with my lead foot before I kick with my right foot because it opens my hips better, right? And I think that that if you think about those little nuances as opposed to trying to say, okay, well, when I'm doing when I'm doing Tong Yu or I'm doing Sejong or one of the other advanced forms in Taekwondo, I'm going to look like the general put it in the textbook hmm. if that's how it was designed to be done. When I'm going to do, you know, when I'm really focusing on that, that's that's that. But when I go free form, I'm going to look at these other things that make sense and that I've been able to incorporate into my own personal style mm. in ways that I can use them in that. And that, and I I encourage that. I encourage even you know my Taekwondo students over the years. I've said, look, this might help you a little bit. I mean. Taekwondo with all the kicks that go on in it, and you've probably seen it and experienced it. Biggest complaint, man, that hurts my hips. Even uh, your old friend, my new friend, Bill Wallace, how many, he's had two hip replacements, right? I think it's at least, at least two. Yeah. We might be past two. 
Okay. Yeah. So you know what happens? That's guess what? I mean, we kick, we kick hard, and and Bill mm-hmm. particularly kicks really hard, right? So you know, it, and and you wind up doing things. So if you can give just a little bit of a tip, maybe make that not happen so much. Like, you know, encouraging it. And you know, sometimes it's just a matter of paying more attention to what really happens. And sometimes the textbooks don't cover that part of it as well. You know, some of the older texts, you learn these things as you go along that, you know, the pivot when you, you do your kick, point your lead foot, lead heel at your mm-hmm. target. Step, which should you step in front or in back if I'm doing a roundhouse kick to the side or a side kick to the side? Things that, you know, physiologically make more sense, right? Not necessarily change the art to say, you know, Kempo is better than Taekwondo. No. Maybe the way Kempo does this move is better than the way Taekwondo does it. But if you're going to focus on the discipline, focus on the discipline and remember the other things because you might find it off to yourself. That's so what, I, what I'm hearing, makes any sense it, it, I, I think it does. Let me, let me mirror some of it back to you what i'm hearing is the art exists as the art but you also have your own individual uh expression and there are times where you stay within the the boundaries of the art and there are times where you are expressing things as you are because even even if we learn we, we could go to the same class start at the same time learn from the same person the exact same things and we're still going to have a slightly different take on it because yeah. we have different bodies right yeah and and so that, that yeah i'm with you i mean you don't have to go all jackson pollock on it you know <laughs> but you can you can certainly modify your approach to the way you, you describe something that's what makes us unique as individuals yeah. right the the, anal- the example that I, I often give is when I used to compete, I would make small modifications to my forms. I knew the competition way that I would do it. And if I was back in class, I would do it the way I was originally taught. Right. And that was kind of the, the agreement my instructors made. I mean, as long as you don't forget the quote right way, we don't care. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm with you. And I did the, the same things. I mean, there were many forms that you know, if, if if you're competing in a tournament to win a, a, an award in, in forms, I mean, today you got to get acrobatic in a lot of cases, unless you're really in a traditional deal. But, but there are still certain nuances, right? I mean, if you if you go strictly with some of the way the taekwondo forms, and you see it a lot, right? I mean, I can point to you grand champion winners on YouTube in taekwondo that are robotic. Mm-hmm. In their the way they execute their form because they are executing it precisely in accordance with the encyclopedia, mm-hmm. with the manual. And I show you others that will do that form more like the the way the Japanese uh, and the Okinawans tend to do their forms with martial intent. And and if I don't see that personally as a judge, if I don't see that martial intent in your face and in your movements, I don't care if you've got every movement precisely right. All you did was a dance for him. And I have gigged exceptional black belts on it and then counseled them later on why I didn't give them the, the, the same number of points as the guy next to me. Yeah. It's because I think we need to not forget that we are a martial art. And I think that if you look at uh, the way some of the Japanese and Okinawan practitioners perform their, their kata, it, it shows there mm-hmm. that that is, that is the case. No, I, I'm, I'm completely with you. Right? Yeah. I, I used to get accused of, well, not accused because it was true, of doing taekwondo forms as a karateka. I was yeah. like, ah. but, but I got away with it because my taekwondo instructor started in karate. So he's like, I get yeah. it. I get it. Stop it. But I get it. <laughs> right. And, and you know, we talked about, you mentioned uh, Po Run, the, the, the uh, second degree black belt form in traditional style. So it, it's basically the, the one that you would, in effect, do against the wall. It's all straight line this way and that way, right? I am. I, I, I wouldn't do this in a performance, but when I do that form for myself, I do it almost Tai Chi-ish, mm. right? Because there are so many movements there that you can, you can do in such a way that it's about breath control. It's about focus. Most Taekwondo practitioners that I know, advanced black belts, hate that form because they don't think it's dynamic enough. Right. I personally think it's a great form for focus, breath control, and discipline. 
And I do them sometimes very slowly, almost like a Tai Chi. I know someone who believes everything we need for self-defense is contained in one of the karate versions of, of that form, that there's so much complexity mm -hmm. that says, uh, every time I think I've found everything in there, I, I, I find something else. Right. And there's some, some I mean, it, sadly, in most Taekwondo schools, you don't really get into what the Japanese would call the bunkai, right, mm -hmm. of the form. Um, and uh, the Hosen in in, uh, in Korean to show that practical application and the variations on that practical application. Because I think that, as you said, there are so many complexities. I can show yeah. you how this, you know, um, in the very most basic form in Chungji Hyung, you know, and that, they don't call him Hyung anymore because right. Hyung is the Korean word for Japanese for for kata, basically. So they, <laughs> you gotta you gotta call him Tool now, right? right. Uh, uh, yeah, say. But uh, nevertheless, the the Chungji, the very first turn to the left and down block. For folks who so, don't know Taekwondo, it's uh, very close to your Heian Pinyon Shodan or Taekyoko Shodan. Yeah, 19 movements, you know, separated into two parts, basically, and it's all in four directions at the end of the day. And the first movement is a turn to the left from, from a, a ready position, turn to the left with a front stance, left hand down block, and then step forward with a punch. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously, you're, you're, the most obvious thing is there is I'm turning to the left and I'm blocking a front kick, and then I'm stepping forward with a punch. One of the other methods is, is that while you're in that ready position, you've been grabbed from behind. So as I, I'm turning, what I'm doing is I'm hooking my foot inside my opponent's foot. Mm -hmm. I'm pushing it forward and I'm turning, throwing down, thus throwing my opponent who's grabbed me from behind to right. the ground while then executing that punch forward. So, but you know what, what uh, if you look at how many of these things you can think about, so it really comes down to what, practical application of that series of techniques or that movement could you use mm. back to the hammer and the nail perception, right? If Well, I can't use it for that because I don't want this person throwing at me. No, I may be able to use it for a variety of different things and still use that same combination of, of turn, block, block with the shin even as you are turning, following on. So I, I do think that it takes a creative mindset to get to it. And I don't like the concept of anything being cubbyhole to the point where it's codified, that it must mean this. Yep. Because I think all of the, the practitioners, when they were developing these things, envisioned something. But you also, as you just said, you always find another thing. You know, yep. What if it was this, right? And, and I, I honestly believe that the more advanced you become, it is that discovery process that is most important in your advancement. Uh, you should be able to take what you know and what you've learned over the last few years, even if you're decades in, and go back to that first form you learned and see it in a whole different way. Because if you can't, what are you doing? Right. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you, Jeremy. I mean, I told you I do a series of forms as part of my daily routine. One of them is Chungji form. Mm -hmm. So I always do the, the, the first one, and I always do Tony, which was the, the last one. Mm -hmm. and, uh, on the series, because I think that that's yin and yang, right? It's the it's that beginning and mm -hmm. it's that end. But each time you do it, it's a different thing. You know, when I'm I'm about to conduct a, um, a test here, an examination for a young man moving from fifth degree to sixth degree, mm -hmm. a, a pretty big thing for for this. Yeah. Guy. Obviously, it's a big step forward for sure. And I had him here for a dry run uh, not that long ago, and I have him another one coming back this way, and it's a Uchanji. And he did Chunji. I said, now, close your eyes. I'll do Chunji. And my expectation is you, yeah, you, you end where you started. Mm -hmm. Every right back to where you begin. You know the drill, right? And unfortunately, you know, unless you really can visualize it, this guy would wind up facing off 30 degrees or, you know, this because you lose orientation if you don't really visualize and internalize that visualization. And I think that by doing that internalization, you do evolve. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, you're in your mind, not not the form itself, but in your execution. So you understand why everything happens in the order that it happens and with the timing that needs to happen, you know, to get it there. 
all we are is advanced students, you know, right? I mean, you know, we've got a few more, uh, you know, cute little marks on our belts, and you know, maybe uh, <laughs> maybe the uniform went up a size for some folks, but uh, but the uh, the bottom line is, is that if we're nothing more than white belts with a lot more experience, you know, behind it. So, uh, I I, f I fully agree. I, I love being a white belt. You know, there for me, there's nothing better than a learning environment where there. I'm not being held to any expectations because mm -hmm. that's where, I, when I learn the best, you know, it's just like, ah. it's not always great being in the back of the room. Cause sometimes you can't quite see people who know what they're doing, right. but, but just that, you know, I, I, I'm one of the first people to put on a white belt. It's like, Oh, I, I can, I can learn this thing. Great. Yep. You know, and I'm, I'm sure you've had a similar experience in that the longer you've been training, if the only standard by which you determine whether someone has someone something to teach you is their rank or their time training, you have a smaller and smaller group of people to learn from. And that, that bums yeah. me out. I, I, I absolutely hundred percent agree with you right there. I mean, that, you know, I think that being that open and understanding that, you know, okay, so you got some years behind you, but that doesn't mean you're not still a student, you know, maybe you're a more serious student because you appreciate those things. Right. But and, and and how much do you learn from teaching? I mean, I I so get much. more back from when I teach, even even the the most basic of movements. Right. Let me get this right because I'm trying to pass this on, and it causes you to reflect and get deeper in your own understanding. Yeah. There's there's nothing like running out of ways to explain something that is so fundamental to you, and somebody's not getting, it and you're going, okay. I obviously need to go deeper into what this is to have a different understanding to be able to explain it to you in a way that you're going to get it or demonstrate it or work, you know, just yeah. the job is to convey that information. The better you know that information, the better you can convey it. Agreed. Yep. hundred percent. And, and, you know, beyond a, a, a certain point in whatever martial art, I believe that really, you know, you are as a practitioner and as, you know, call it master, call it grandmaster, whatever honorific you want to put on there, it doesn't make much difference to me, you know, in the course of all of that. But the, the um, you know, you really do need to be wide open about your, your, your lack of knowledge and your mm -hmm. understanding that it is what it is. And it's about your contributions to the art from that point forward, right? How, mm -hmm. much, are, how much else are you doing to try to help, like, of this, the thing you do right here. I mean, I think this is a beautiful thing. And uh, David Hodgson has uh, black belt interviews. He's out of mm -hmm. uh, Great Britain, and he has some very interesting things too. But he gets he gets a diverse group of people on there. His his program, I believe, is primarily focused, if not exclusively focused, on Taekwondo. You know, pick a flavor of Taekwondo, but Taekwondo wow. practitioners. Whereas my perception of what you do really it crosses an awful lot of boundaries. And I we're we're actually actively thing. looking for, you know, if, if somebody if somebody says, I train in this, and it's rare, but once in a while I'll say, I, I don't know what that is. Mm. I want to get them on the show. Right. Because, you know, it's 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 the arts, but it's the people, it's the you talked about it as advancement, you know, advancing not just yourself, but the arts. You know, one of the things I've spent some time and actually if, if I may, I'd like to share this with you because I'm curious of your Please. thoughts. Yeah. You know, we we often are presented with these, I guess, scenarios or cliches of, of a prototypical school where the instructor tries to mold the students into their own image. Mm -hmm. And I look at that and I say, okay, I'm never going to be, let's say you're my instructor. I'm never going to be you. I can train a million years. You, I could train with you for five years. You could move away and I could spend the next 50 years continuing to work what you've given me. And it's, I'm still never going to do it your way. I'm right. going to be at best 99 point whatever percent of you. And so if I repeat that with my students and they repeat that with their students, now we're getting worse over time. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. I think that is yeah. so ridiculous. The idea that, that if we love something, we would set it up in a system that is doomed to degradation. The only way we can do that is you teach me what... Excuse me one second. Sorry, this room is off limits. You don't have to cut that out. <laughs> I'm making note of that. Sorry. It's okay. Yeah, but no, you're you're absolutely right. Um that yeah, and, and it's you know, not only 
that, but you're also any any mistake, any uh, you know that's the way I learned it. I mean, the, mm-hmm. the thing I hate most, and from my perspective as a, a, a management consulting or whatever else, is well, that's the way we've always done it. You know, even if it was wrong, all you're doing is perpetrating an error. And again, as you said, right. I mean that that it, that degradation begins to take um, effect going on forward. So it's better to know. I Man, I have been corrected on things that I thought I was doing right for decades. Bachman Kim was classic at that. When I trained with him in New Jersey, I'm doing a high block. No, you got to turn thirty degree. And I mean, he was precise in exactly what he expected to see, and that was from old school traditional founder's perspective of mm. how it should be done, not some of the things. I mean, can't say I was ineffective with my blocks, but right. I w- maybe not have been that mirror image perfect. It can, can always be a little bit better. And, always can be. you know, I would imagine that, you know, as you said, a, a, an ongoing student, you welcome that. You want to Absolutely. Learn. You want yes. to get better. Whereas, you know, sadly, if, if, we, if we can go back to this, you know, theoretical that sadly does play out in quite a few schools, the instructors who are molding folks in their image, in my observation, they tend to do much less demonstration on their own, you know, to their classes, they'll have, you know, a senior student and then correct them because they don't want to look imperfect. Right. And there's nothing less motivating to a student than the belief that someone is perfect and that you will never get to be that good. Right. But yeah. The flip no, side I, I, to show that you are imperfect, that you are working on things is incredibly motivating to students because it gives them permission to not be perfect. Right. And there you go. And it's, it's a, it's an entirely different world out there from the early days, you know, when I began training in Taekwondo with these Korean masters that were first generation Korean masters, there was no, how would you feel about, Mm. Followed by whatever you wanted to, you know, to accomplish, it was you do it this way. You know, mm. it was very strict and it was very disciplined. Fortunately, it was also you know as close to perfect as you'd ever want to see it from these guys, right? Because that right. they were first generation guys in the system, and that's they learned from the founders. Mm-hmm. So they they were imparting that discipline. But then over the course of time, like you said, I mean. You go on and you teach this and you teach that. And the next thing that you know is you find your bad habits being perpetrated, you know, by your students. And then for, right. and that proliferates against their students. And yeah, so it's it's a it's a challenge. But now I think uh, I, I sort of pity a lot of instructors today who are teaching. I mean, I think we both know that the, what's the average age of a martial artist in the United States, nine? Probably. You know? Yeah, right. And it's a, you have to talk to them differently. You have to, you know, you have to encourage them differently. You you have to motivate them differently because it's a, it's a different level of sensitivity in that group than, mm. than we have, you know, as older school uh, martial arts people. God forbid you should ever hit a kid with the Shanai, you know, mm. you know, even a, a, a 17 or 18 year old with, you know, crack them on the back of the legs with a, a Shania as a as a form of discipline, and even if it's not a wind up, even if it's up, you know, uh, yeah, a startle just, with some noise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is basically, you know, with the Shania, that's kind of what we were all getting anyway. Nobody got the. We weren't caned to death for failing to do a technique. I, I, I've never been caned to death. No, that's yes, good. right. Thank you. Well, it's good to. Otherwise, we'd have a very short interview here. We would. Day. We would. Uh, but yeah, so so it is. It's a different kind of discipline, I think, and a different way to exhibit all of those things and correct them. But the worst thing you can do is not correct them. You know, let let little Johnny or little Sally continue on doing it incorrectly. First thing I look at when I go visit a school is how are the white belts belts tied? If you can't (laughs) encourage them to (laughs) teach them how to tie a belt properly, it's going to go downhill from there. I will say that one of the biggest correlations I see between what we're with uh, general and overall quality of student is belt tying. And I don't just mean it white belt. I understand if someone's new and, you know, they're struggling to remember 
which whether, are, whether they're to put the pants on their arms or not. Right. <laughs> but as I look up, I mean, I, I've I've been to schools where black belts, I mean, consistently black belts have their belts tied weird. You know, you got one 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 leg of the belt sticking up in their yeah. face. You know, and I'm like. And then I look over the instructor and the instructor doesn't tying it that way. It's like, okay, you're missing detail. You're right. not as concerned with detail. And right. yeah, if somebody's nine, maybe you hold them to a different standard of detail than if they're 35. Yeah, maybe. I'm not sure. Depending on what it is, right? Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. When it comes to belt tying, if they're not tied properly, I'm going to untie them and tie them myself. I'm going to show them. I'm going to teach them. And, I, and I've been known to do that in classes that I visited as an instructor or as a referee or whatever, basically to say, come here, you know, and, and show them, teach them the right way, you know. For, and, you know, it's 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 somewhat different. And you have to be cognizant of the school. I mean, I think there are some Japanese or Okinawan systems that do look for the X in the back of the belt. Mm -hmm. But in traditional Taekwondo, it's one element of the belt showing them. And understanding how to get that, you know, everything proper to do it the right way. It, it's like making your bed in the morning, right? If you never encourage your children to make their beds in the morning, what discipline do you, you know, that's the beginning. It's the very first thing of the discipline as you start off in the day. And if you encourage that at an early age and don't put up with the, 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 the variations and the flaws, but continue to correct until it becomes mm -hmm. second nature, I think what you're, you're generating there is you're generating a more disciplined young adult and hopefully a more disciplined adult as a result mm. of that. The very basic, the smallest of things. I want to ask a broad question, and you know, it's a theoretical one as well. Let's let's pretend I gave you a, a magic wand or a, a a lamp. I'd stolen two of the witches out of it, and I give you a lamp, and uh, you've got to wave that wand or make that wish. For martial arts in general, you know, let's let's open it up from being specific to Taekwondo because you certainly have experienced enough outside of Taekwondo that I, I think your perspective is quite relevant. What would that wish be? What what would you wish for the martial arts world? What spell would you cast? Good, I think it's a really good question and it's thought provoking. So I think um, if I had one wish in the martial arts world, it would be to do away with the politi politicalization mm. of the various disciplines. It doesn't make any difference. You know, when you get right down to it, your body only moves so many ways, right? There are only so many things you can do and unless, and, and I'm going to take a cheap shot here and I can do this because I've actually been to the classes uh, in, in Pennsylvania. If you take a George Dillman approach where I'm going to knock you down through this screen Mm -hmm. um, using, you know, key energy. That may be stretching it a little bit, but I think that the rest of the martial arts disciplines, when you get right down to it, we are philosophically aligned in most ways. We are physically aligned in most ways. Mm -hmm. Our front stances look like front stances. You know, maybe one's a little deeper or one is a little deeper. So let's check all of the judgmental elements at the door mm -hmm. and recognize one another as brothers and sisters in an art form, you know, that plays. I will, you know, I'm a guitar player, right? Mm -hmm. So I will appreciate a Segovia class, classical flamenco guitar player and be mesmerized by it. And at the same time, you know, B.B. King blows my socks off, right? So, and there's such a vast difference. Uh, Tommy Emmanuel, a classical guitar player or as a, as a as an acoustic guitar player a friend of mine uh, you know was uh, Yorma Kalkinen he was the founding guitarist for Jefferson Airplane he plays mm. for Hot Tuna he's, he's a very dear friend of mine and he had Tommy teach at one of his camps and he said, I said what'd you think he said I'm just glad I didn't have to pay him by the note because he's you know he's all over the place yeah. B.B. King played like four notes ever <laughs> you yep. know but guess what what are they both doing they're playing guitar they're making beautiful music that people that touch people emotionally. They're doing this. They have the same number of frets on their guitars. Mm -hmm. They have the same chords that have to be played on their guitars. They just use them in slightly different ways. So let's kind of bring everything back to the fact that if I had my wish, we are all martial artists and brothers and sisters 
you know, beneath whatever color pajamas we're wearing today. <laughs> right? It so is there it is. Beautifully said. And and I couldn't agree more. Uh, a lot of the work that we we are doing is to try and I mean, you 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 took about three of my catchphrases and read them through there. There's only so many ways <laughs> that you can move. And we have more in common than we do that separates us. And it, it is it is my hope. You know, one of the things that I, I think is happening, and I'm curious of your opinion on this as well. Pre-internet, it was very easy to say, you know, that this is this is the way, this is the best. You stumbled into the best school ever, you know, and really, you know, essentially lie to students mm -hmm. because they didn't have the ability to, you know, see what was going on. But that seems to be falling away very, very quickly as the people who wanted to run their schools that way, frankly, get older and pass away. And what we're left with is people who, whether they want to or they have to, are much more acknowledging of the way other people do things and say, well, you know, I guess the way they do this over here isn't that bad. And right. I think that, you know, to kind of bring it full circle, the, if the if if continuing to try to mimic perfectly over time leads to degradation. The individualization, you know, we talked about the art of Taekwondo versus your personal art, right? Be the ability to develop your own personal art by acknowledging what else is going on means you can progress and that the arts right. can progress. Right. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree with that. And, you know, I've seen it, you know, time and again. I mean, there was uh, first moved to New Hampshire, I lived in Southern New Hampshire. And, uh, you know, I'm still training. I have a dojang in my property. I always have a dojang place to train in my property. But uh, there was a school down the road from me. And, I, you know, you, you can train on your own and you can really do well. And you, but you do the same things mm -hmm. over and over again. And you, you keep your fitness level and you keep your focus on the things you do. But training with somebody else and training with a group of people. I mean, the group dynamic takes effect. And, you know, learning that, just like we said, learning that, that new stuff. From somebody mm -hmm. else. So there was a school, uh, and I won't go into the name of the school or the system because it's not relevant. Yep. But it was uh, it was not a taekwondo school. And I mm -hmm. went there and I introduced myself to the sensei at that school, and I said, "Look, I'd like to come down and train with you." And he said, "You're taekwondo." I said, "Yeah." He said, "There's a taekwondo school about 20 miles up the road down here." I'm like, well, yeah, I kind of knew that, but you know, you're five miles from my house, and I'm interested in what you've got to say. He said, "Yeah, I think uh, you should look up the taekwondo school." I'm like really, who's who's threatened here? I'm not threatened. You know, right. give me my white belt and let me stand in the back of your class it, and exactly and learn these new things. And and it's it's just um, it really is sad because it goes back to what you said. Who knows really what the the lineage, the history, or you know whatever this individual had that he didn't want really exposed to somebody else who might be more experienced or have different experiences. Right? You know what else I hear in that situation? Someone who was not confident in their skills. That they well, right, precisely. They yes, didn't right. really know what they were teaching because they were threatened by someone with with time and rank. Well, right. if I can't show it to somebody who's really good, then I mean, or or perhaps there's trauma. You know, there was some trauma. I've, been, I've there's known some traumatic instructors. Reasons, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe, right? At the end of the day, you know, there used to be an old joke about um, about taekwondo in the early days, in the '70s, that a taekwondo black belt would get on the airplane in Seoul as a second degree and land in San Francisco as a fifth degree, right? Yes. And and <laughs> yes, I, <heard laughs> I think if you look at some of that. It's not just taekwondo. I don't. No, oh, oh, definitely not. No, uh, it, you know, yeah, man, I I spent uh, six months in Okinawa when I was in the Air Force, and I came home, and I'm a third degree black belt. Well, okay, you know, but who's to say they weren't? Because there was no really way to to focus on it, and you know, the uh, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed king man is king, isn't that what they say? So I come into a small town America, and I hang up a sign that says karate, and I've got the outfit, and I know some of the moves. I don't know the difference, you know, and you could be learning it the day before you teach it to me. That's right. As a management consultant, I've become an expert on many topics on the train between my office <laughs> and the client. There, there <laughs> is, if the role is simply to pass on knowledge and to help people progress, there is nothing yeah. wrong with that methodology. Maybe not the best methodology, but it, it can work. Right. 
as long as you yourself continue to evolve and learn. I mean, if, if that's the nexus of your better development, good on you, you know, as long as you take that next step and you don't continue to, to you know, perpetrate the, uh, the, you know, diffusion of what really is going on. Out there. Are there things that you're working towards or looking forward to, you know, if, if we look in the future for you and your training? Yeah, for my, I mean, you know, two things. Number one, Jeremy, I am 72 years old, right? So I do continue to train. I can I train every day. If I'm do, not doing yoga one day, it's martial arts the next day. So there's a continual stream. My wife and I both are, are really focused on health and well-being. Mm -hmm. My goal for, for where I'm at as a martial artist is to continue to try to move the message forward. You know, much like what we're doing today. I was I was thrilled that you invited me on this program today because I think it's an opportunity to maybe broaden minds and continue to contribute to the art. Um, you know, the the uh, working with a few private advanced black belt students, I have no desire to open a new school and teach a bunch of nine and eleven. So it's just not, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And, and I'm not, you know, people have said to me, well, open a school and then hire people to do the work. Well, no, that's, who's that? Mm. That's not me. Unless I train that black belt from, you know, from day one or can vet him to a, a great degree, why would I pay somebody to, to you know, and use my name right. to, to further that? That's not where my head is. You know, as a U.S. Army, former U.S. Army Ranger, I never used the, that as a means to advance mm. my career, to advance me as a human being. I never would use that reference because I honor that too greatly. I would not use the fact that I am a, you know, deemed a grandmaster in the art of Taekwondo to further a mission just to make some money. I don't need any money. You know, I'm, I'm pretty okay. But at the end of the day, it's, I do want to help serious advanced students continue to advance towards mastery, uh, ultimately maybe grand mastery and so on, you know, and uh, continue to participate in those kinds of opportunities or in, uh, around, you know, wherever the country or the world to move the message forward and to, to help elevate uh, others into you know, an understanding of the art that mm -hmm. really contribute more to the art. You know, I'm, I'm a special advisor to the president of the um, uh, Chung Kun Taekwondo Federation. Hmm. I'm a, I'm a regional director for the International Jung Tung Federation. Those sorts of things really mean something to me because it gives me an opportunity to, to help others grow. So that's my view of my future as a martial artist and maintaining my health. So maybe I'm still kicking at least shoulder high for you know another 10 years or so, however much longer I have in the shell, yeah. you know. In, uh, in, on this earth. I, my runway is a lot shorter than it used to be. There's a lot more runway behind me than in front of me, I'm afraid, at 72 years old. Well, it, it seems like you're you're taking it in stride. And, you know, how, how many of your contemporaries, what even within the martial arts, aren't even kicking above the waist? Right. You well, know? and you know what, Jeremy? I've got a pair of... Uh, of uh, century pro fighter pants that lace up the front that I've been wearing and still wear. And I've been wearing them since 1978. So at the end of the day, I know an awful lot of folks and not just in the martial arts that are at my age that are not wearing the same pants size they wore in 1978. Yeah. yeah. You know? Well, you, you've probably, I, I mentioned it to somebody the other day, that cliche image of, of, you know, instead of the evolution of man, you know, Homo sapiens, Homo erectus, yeah, right? Yeah. It's first dawn, second dawn, third dawn, and you know the belly right. gets bigger. Yeah, right. I've seen that image, and unfortunately, it is uh, sad but true. You know, I know a, a phenomenal uh, sipu, uh, a kung fu practitioner out in the Midwest, who said this is his ball of ki. I'm like, okay, call it what you want. You know, what you got there is, you know, dairy, cheese. <laughs> Let's break it down to its, its finer elements, but. So it's a ball of cheese, not cheese, maybe, but they, uh, anyway, and, and then, you can't choices are choices. I mean, it's right. Yeah, we, we've we've talked about health and we've talked about weight on this show and how it relates to martial arts. And that you know, if somebody comes in and they're new to this show, I don't I don't want you to think that you know we're not we're not shaming anyone for for no, being no. where they're at. Um, right. 
you know, we, we all have to follow our choices and, and, you know, if, if being healthy is important to you, well, then it's important to you and you should yeah, make it yeah, important and, to you. And if it's not, I'm telling you, that's your choice. That's a precisely hundred percent. I mean, I, I, I'm going to say this and I'm going to say something else. So, so I am a vegan and have been mm-hmm. for about, about three years now. And it was one of the best decisions I ever made for my own personal health. Uh, but I don't, I'm not militant about it. You know, right. it's like the old joke of, uh, you know, a, a, a vegan CrossFit pr- practitioner comes into a bar. Which one does he talk about first? You know, right. so, <laughs> the senior is like, usually there's somebody who's so militant about the one thing they really want to focus on that uh, that nothing else is appropriate. And for me, it's about choices, right? You're going you're gonna to find that there are healthy choices that you can make. I'm a, I'm a Chopra certified meditation instructor. Mm-hmm. Meditation has been a, an important element of my life. Uh, I was just on the cover of Totally Taekwondo Times magazine, Totally Taekwondo magazine uh, a few months ago. And the whole article that I wrote was on meditation in the martial arts, meditation mm-hmm. in, in Taekwondo, but in the martial arts in general. And why, you know, and let's just take the last part of it, meditation, and leave that because it is so important in your life, you know, regardless of, I've had, People say, well, you know, that's kind of heathenness. Well, no, you can't look at it like that. I don't care what your discipline is, religious discipline, if you even have one. It doesn't matter. If you're religious, remember this. Prayer is talking to God. Meditation is listening. Mm -hmm. Meditating and calming yourself and centering yourself is your opportunity to receive from the universe, you know, or from within yourself, however you choose to perceive it. But at the very worst case, it calms your ass down. You know, right? Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it kind of puts you in the right place uh, for that moment in time, in those stressful moment. And it's, uh, but but those are all choices. And, you know, the, the hardest people to convince of some of these choices and the benefits of them one way or the other are your own friends and family. And, uh, you know, it goes back to the, the old saying that no man is a prophet in his own hometown. You know, people people listen to me when I talk. I said, I know you're a consultant as well, so I know you get it too. I was a consultant with Deloitte. I got hired by a big company to design a massive telecommunications network for them. And then they hired me to come and run it. They stole Mm -hmm. me away from the consulting firm. Six months into the consulting firm or to the new company, I made a suggestion on a change. And they said, don't you think we ought to get an outside opinion on it? I said, well, (laughs) I was the outside outside opinion. opinion, Yeah, to come and work for you. So, But the same thing is true. I mean, it's easier for, it would be easier for you to tell one of my kids about the right things that they should be doing than it is for, for them to want to listen to dad because what does dad know? You know, and, and it, I, I find the same thing true in so many cases. If you really want to stop a conversation on Facebook, start talking about being a vegan. You mm-hmm. know, <laughs> immediately you go from 500 likes over here to, you know, nothing on this side. But, but it's, uh, it, it, it is about choice. And it's about arriving at the choice for yourself. If you don't want to change something, if you don't want to learn something new, if you don't want to improve yourself in any way, you won't. Mm. You have to want that change. You have to, you know, and, and all you can do from my perspective, as I've told my students and my family, when you look for me, you'll see the back of my head going down the right path. You can follow me. And and if you do, maybe good things will happen. Hmm. Or you can go on over here and you know wave at me when we, when we see each other down the road. But uh, but you can't force, you can't dictate change. You have to lead towards it. Hmm. Well said. Well said. If people want to get a hold of you, you know, you put some things out. I've got a feeling some people might want to get in touch. How, how would they do that? You know, email, social, website, yeah, anything like that well, you want to share? Mean, you know, uh, if, if you don't mind my my uh, totally inane humor that I start almost every morning at on Facebook. My Facebook is Eddie Minyard mm-hmm. uh, on Facebook. Um, Edward Minyard on Twitter, if anybody's interested in using that medium. Um, I have a, uh, a website that is uh, edwardminyard.com. Um, I am an also an author. I didn't really go into that, but I've written uh, three novels and one sort of autobiographical book. 
Uh, I have a website for my books called edwardminyardbooks.com. You name things very simply, just as we often do. Well, it makes, yeah, you know, it's, Make it's it so easy. easy to remember that, right? Yeah. As opposed to my company name, which is zerogapsolutions.com, which... Oh, that's know, a real... I like that name. That's a great well, name. It's, uh, it's all about cybersecurity and information technology and crisis management. And, should be zero gaps in the course of that. Hmm. Yet another technology person in the martial arts. A and musician. A huge right? overlap. And yeah. musician. It seems to be one or the other. We don't get too many both. but Yeah. 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 Well, you know, uh, if I could get all five voices in my head going the same direction in any given day, <laughs> I could probably settle in on one thing. But I have a pretty diverse uh, interest set. You know, that comes around to it. I can relate to that. But it's all art to me, right? Yeah. We've covered a lot of ground today and in the audience, you know, we've taken them, you've taken them in a lot of different directions, great directions. And I've really enjoyed our conversation, but this is where it wraps up. This is where we end. So how do you want to leave it for them? What what, what words do you want to give them as well, we roll I, out? Geez, I guess uh, if I were to leave anybody with one word, it, it would be you know, pretty simple. Open your minds. You know, open your minds to not just martial arts, but open your minds in general. I mean, there's two sides to everything. You may not like one side or the other side, but if you don't understand both sides, how can you make a reasonable judgment mm -hmm. about where you really want to fall on, on topic du jour? I don't care what it is. I'm not going to go in any direction. I'm just going to leave it with that. Open your minds, expand your worldview. And, uh, and that's where I'll leave it. And I really appreciate you inviting me on the show, Jeremy. Look forward to doing more things with Whistle Kick down the road, and maybe getting involved in your symposium again next year to, you know, to do uh, you know, a little practical taekwondo uh, exhibition, you know, in, in class and, as uh, we move forward. I really enjoyed my conversation with Grandmaster Minier, and I hope you did too. I hope that you got some stuff to think about, some things to contemplate, because I think that that is the best part of what we do. We get you to think. So keep thinking. Grandmaster Minyard, thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate you. I'm sure I will see you again soon. Audience, please be sure to, let's see, what do I want you to do? I want you to go check out the Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Whistlekick. Starts at two bucks a month. I want you to check out Whistlekick.com with the code PODCAST15 to save 15% on something. I also want you to take a moment and remember why you train. I think that's really important. What gets you out of bed and into your training? It's not something to think about. Maybe you should. If you want to reach out to me with feedback or suggestions on topics or guests, my email address is jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at whistlekick everywhere you might think of. Don't forget, I offer seminars. We have consulting services. We do a ton of things, more than I can talk about in these intros and outros. And that's why I push you all to go to whistlekick.com and poke around. I, I, I would suggest you do that at least once a month because we're constantly adding things. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your support. And I will see you on the next episode. Take care, everybody. Train hard, smile, have a great day. I almost missed it.